We know our day is coming When we look into your eyes And see your final sleeves no. Your final sleeves Your final sleeves everyone and welcome to Mountaintop Community Church. Whether you're live here in the room or whether you're watching online, it's great to have you guys here with us this morning on this lovely August Sunday morning. School's about to start. Parents, you excited? <laughs> yeah, you should be more excited than that. Come on. Hey, our mission and our purpose here at our church is learning and then we share a better way of life in Jesus Christ. Because we believe this. A lot of people are looking for a better way to live. We believe the answer is found in Jesus Christ. So welcome to that. If you're a guest here, whether somebody brought you or whether you just came by, you heard something was going on here in the mountain, we're excited to have you here. Whether you come from a church background or you've never really been to church much at all, it's great to have you guys here. It's awesome. Please take a moment, take your bulletin and tear off this portion here, this perforated part, and bring it over here to the corner out in the atrium, you know, the Krispy Kreme Donuts. It's a place called Starting Point. And hand this to these people. We have a gift we want to give to you. Just say thanks for coming. And if you have any questions about our church, we'd love to answer those questions. A couple announcements for you, and then we'll get on with our service. I have two dates I want you guys to remember. The first date is August 24th, and that day is for our Crown Ministry Seminar. You can pick up one of these cards when you walk in the door. I don't know if you're like me, but I'm always looking for ways to help out with issues of budgeting and financing and spending and saving. This is an incredible seminar to help you with all those things. So if you've never been to this, I highly, highly encourage you to take an afternoon and part of a morning and check this out. August 24th. Next announcement, August 18th. Huge day for us at Mountaintop at our church. It's Promotion Sunday. It's when everybody from birth to high school are going to move up one year. They're going to meet their new teachers. They're going to, going to go to their new environments. I want to highlight two areas for you on August 18th. The children's area. We need some volunteers. So if you have a heart for children, Melissa Sanderson and her staff would love to talk to you about plugging you in and serving in the children's ministry. Second thing about August 18th, the student ministry on Sunday morning is changing. We have two new environments starting at 9.30 for the middle school students and 11.15 for the high school students. Let me say that again. 9.30 for the middle school students, 
11.15 for the high school students at the FLC. There'll be live music with a new worship leader and band, communicators, small groups, incredible environment for your kids to engage the gospel right where they are. So highly encourage you to check that out, especially if you come here in this big building and maybe you're a teenager with your parents, just get down to the FLC. It's gonna be incredible for you. August 18th. All right, Doug's going to continue our series this morning in the book of Daniel. I hope you guys have enjoyed that series as much as I have. Before we jump back, back into that and some music, let's say hello to the people around you. Let's find somebody we've never met before and introduce ourselves. Let's do that right now.
two brothers, Jacob and Caleb Jowers. And y'all say hi. Y'all wave to everybody and, and say hi. And during Vacation Bible School, we focused on the fact that we are loved by God. Remember how sweet it is? And y'all were rocking out in the air and doing a lot of that. But uh, one day we gave some of our students an opportunity to receive Christ, and you both responded to that. And so today we get the joy of celebrating your baptism. And that is a really, really big deal. Your mom was telling me uh, right before we came out that one of your family's favorite verses is uh, out of the Old Testament. It's Zephaniah 317. And it is one of my favorite verses as well. And it simply says that the God, that our Lord God, 
God is mighty to save and that he will quiet us with his love and he will rejoice over us with singing. And one of the things that is happening as we are here celebrating your profession of faith and baptism this morning is that heaven is rejoicing in singing. And, uh, and all of heaven is just watching and celebrating as the two of you profess your faith. And so I think that's a pretty cool deal. Don't you? All right, well, uh, Jacob, I'm going to have you come in first. And turn around, if you would, just step right there on that step, and kind of turn around. And I was thinking about this, you know, Jacob was in the Bible, and one of the things that happened with Jacob is that he wrestled with God, and at the end of that wrestling came a blessing. And one of the things that I'm convinced in life, as we follow Jesus Christ, that there are times of wrestling, but at the end of all of it will always come a blessing, and God has blessings in store for you. But when we are blessed, our challenge then is to be a blessing to others. And so I want to charge you with that today. That as you profess your life to Christ, you're going to have an opportunity to bless someone else as you live for him. So let me ask you these very simple questions. Jacob, is Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior? Do you trust him? Do you intend to live your life learning his way and following him each and every day? And do you desire to be baptized? Okay, we'll step down one more. Well then, Jacob, my brother, it is my joy to baptize you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You were buried with Christ in baptism, and you were risen to new life in him. You just stand right up top while your brother comes in. You can get a towel, but wimp. Um, hey, Caleb, turn around too, if you would. I was asking Caleb before if he had any special skills. You can whistle like a madman. You want to do that now? No, I didn't. I I didn't think so. I was kind of impressed by that. Caleb in the Bible was someone who went out um, and saw opportunities and recognized that even those things seemed impossible to everyone else, that they were possible with God. And as you live your life, you're going to see all kinds of opportunities to be a part of God's kingdom. And some people are going to say that's crazy. And some people are going to say that's impossible. But Caleb, I want you to remember that with God on your side, everything is possible. And as you profess your faith in him today, that he is going to be faithful to his promise to empower you to live for him. And so, Caleb, let me ask you the same questions I asked your brother. Is Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior? Do you trust him? Do you intend to live your life learning his ways and following him each and every day? And do you desire to be baptized? All right, step down one more. Caleb, my brother, it is my joy to baptize you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are buried with Christ in baptism, and you are risen to new life in him. Amen. Awesome. Let's stand and worship that one. You bring hope to the hopeless and light to those in the darkness and death to life. Now, now. Alive. Oh, you, oh, you give peace to the restless and joy to homes that are broken. about how this is true for you. Oh, you fear those who are empty and rescue those in the battle through You do this, God. You come out here all week, God.
pray together. Lord, that's the truth that we cling to, that you are everything that we need and you provide everything that we need. And as we gather here to worship you, as we celebrate baptisms and the ways that you are at work transforming lives, Lord, we trust that you are providing all that we need in this life. And so we celebrate that as we worship you today. We do it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And I have been joined on stage by people which is an awesome thing. Hey, in, uh, in just a moment, uh, our ushers are going to come forward, and it's a time in the service where we get to give back to God out of the gifts that he's entrusted to us. But we like to, before we do that, tell you stories about how those gifts are being used to help tell God's story right here at Mountaintop. And as we get off the mountain and we go out into the world to share his life and his love. And uh, we talk a lot about I serving. So some of us are wearing our I serve on and off the mountain t-shirts this morning. And, uh, and we want everyone to find a place where they can serve either on or off the mountain. But we have on stage of us three of our members who are about to get way off the mountain and, uh, and head out in service. And we wanted to introduce them to you this morning and hear a little bit about their story. So Mary Beth, you want to introduce them? Yes, I would love to. So we do short short-term mission trips um, in four different countries. And then I want to introduce to you today our first long-term missionaries. This is Trish and Emery McCharge, and they are going to be missionaries in Bogota, Colombia. So we're so excited for them and where God is leading them. And as soon as they get their support, they'll be heading to Columbia. We know that's going to happen soon. And then this is Miss Maggie Adams. She is one of our young professionals. And she is going to be our first midterm missionary, which means that she is going to be gone for at least one year and maybe two. She is going to teach in Bethlehem. And she is going to teach at a, um, a school with Palestinian students, both Christian and Muslim. So she has an incredible mission opportunity. And so we're so excited to be up here with you guys today. Yeah. When we challenge you to, uh, to find a place to serve on or off the mountain, we recognize that sometimes that's a scary step of faith for people to take. And it's a kind of a step of faith, whether you're rocking babies in the nursery or heading to Bethlehem. And so one of the things we thought we'd ask you to share with the church this morning was what it what is it that gives you the confidence to be able to take the step of faith? I keep teasing with Maggie that she saw a star in the east and she followed it. To I did. I put it on my T-shirt so that I could and like that's a good thing have on the T-shirt. Come up. Yep. So tell us about what gives you the confidence to take this big step of faith. Well, um, for me, it was a kind of a simple answer. It was I felt the Lord calling me to this place. But as I said before in the first service, just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. A lot of times we hear God's call, and it's very different from what we had planned. And it was definitely very different from my plan. And uh, But I have found in my life that when I do take the time to listen and when I do follow him and, and what he's calling me to do, he has blessed that and done things I couldn't even imagine. And I've had it happen to me a couple times, and that's how I knew he would be faithful this time to do it. Um, when I first went to Bethlehem a couple weeks ago, I went on a short-term mission trip, my very first one, and um, I thought that this may be why he was calling me there to, to be a teacher, but when I got there, it was very intimidating, and it was not very glamorous and not at all what I had planned for myself as far as long-term, but the Lord blessed me with uh, a heart for the people there and for the community. There is so much tension and bitterness and hostility and even hatred because of the Palestinian Israeli conflict and these students grow up in it they it permeates their lives to the point where this this hatred is passed down generation to generation and the school's mission and now mine is to introduce them to a new way of living to live Christ's love every day with grace and understanding for our fellow children in Christ and to to love just live in love because that's the only way that things are going to be resolved, not through governments, but through people. And we want to start with the kids. So that's sort of my call and what I'd like to do. But um, it's not, not easy to follow God's call when, when he presents that to you. But it's what I hope to do and what I challenge y'all to do, I guess. All right, Emery, what you have? Uh, for me, uh, it was through uh, business failing. And I totally surrendered myself uh, to God, and that's a, it's a great place to be. And I just said, God, you know, what do you want me to do? You know, what do you want from me? Uh, famous last words, right? You know, what, God, what do you want me to do? Uh, it's kind of terrifying even asking God that. Um, and March 18th of 2012, 
Manuel Zarate spoke at Mountaintop. And during that entire service, God was speaking to me and saying, you're going to be working with Manuel. You're going to be moving to Bogota. And the rest is history. We're moving to Bogota. I, I laugh every time memory tells the story. We, we were in a small group together last fall. That's the way guys tell story. The rest is history. You know, you don't need... So, Trish, how about a couple of details? <laughs> I would first like to challenge and encourage you this morning. Um, when we were called to Columbia, and we kind of started telling people where we were going, and they would look at us and say, you're crazy. Or they would say, or just look at us like we were crazy. And, you know, we kind of are crazy. But our kingdom assignment looks different than what God may be calling you to do and where you are going to be called to go. And it's okay because we are crazy. And God wants us to all have a crazy love for him. And through that, sorry. Um, yes, through that, he just wants us to um, follow his calling and um, just have faith and be bold in what it is that he's calling us to do. So I challenge you this morning to be bold and don't worry about what other people are saying and have that crazy love for him and go after it. So be bold. Yeah. And uh, that's awesome. The, uh, we really do believe that God has some place for each and every one of you to serve. And it might be here on the mountain or it might be off the mountain. And one of the ways that you can find out what that place might be is by visiting our I Serve desk. And you can do that any Sunday morning. If you do it this morning after the service, Maggie and Trish and Emery are going to be there. And they will tell you a little bit more about the call that God has placed upon their lives and the things that they're going to be doing in Bethlehem and in Bogota and how you can be a part of that and how you can support them. So after the service is over, we'd encourage all of you to get a chance to visit with them there. But we Want to pray. We are so proud of you. We are just so proud of you and, uh, and your courage in responding to God's call upon your life. And so we want to pray for you this morning, and Mary Beth's going to lead us in that. Let's pray together. God, thanks so much um, for a church that wants to fulfill the great commission that you have called us to go into the world, God. And I just thank you for the courage. Um, of Maggie and Trish and Emery who are saying, you know what, God, we're going to leave what's comfortable and we're going to go into your plans instead of having our plans for our life, God. And I thank you. And I just pray an anointing over them, Lord Jesus, that you are already ahead of them and they will continue to follow you and listen closely. God, I cannot wait to see the impact that they're going to make and the impact that is going to be made on them. And I know you have specific ministry ahead for them, God. And I just thank you so much that we as a church get to come alongside them and support them prayerfully and financially. And I pray that even today, someone in here might even be feeling their heart beating a little bit fast to step out also and go on a mission trip or serve in the community or serve here at church, God, because that is when we meet you, when we are being your hands and feet, Lord Jesus. And I love you and I thank you so much um, for these three of your children who are committed to your love and to sharing it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 That's awesome, guys. Our ushers are going to come forward in just a moment, and we do have a chance now to give back to God out of the blessings he's given to us. Uh, if you're here maybe for the first time, it, we don't want you to feel any pressure. It's okay. Just let the bucket pass you by. But if you're part of the Mountaintop family or if you just feel called to give today, we want you to know that the gifts that you give are being used to tell stories like the one that you just heard. They're being used to help make God's love and the life of Jesus Christ known in Bogota and in Bethlehem and right here in Birmingham. Every dollar that you give is being used to help us learn and to share a better way of life in Christ. And so as our ushers come forward and we give back to God, give joyfully, give thankfully, and give with anticipation at the way that God is going to take those dollars and bless them and use them to continue to write his story in this world. Let's continue to worship as we present an offering to God. I am the Lord, your God. I go before you now. I stand beside you. I'm all around you. And though you feel I'm far away, I'm closer than your breath. I am with you more than you know. Oh. 
steady now your heart and mine come into my rest and oh let your faith arise and lift up your weary head I am with you wherever you go Pray together. Lord, what a beautiful reminder that you are everything, that you are all that we need. Lord, take these gifts that we've returned to you, use them to make that truth known in Bethlehem and in Bogota and right here in Birmingham. Use those gifts to help us spread the good news so that we can celebrate more baptisms like Jacob and St. Caleb's. And Lord, we come to you now and, and we ask you to open our hearts as we open your word, open them to truths that you would teach us that might help us grow closer to you. For we pray all of that in Christ's name and we pray it for his glory alone. Amen. Well, we are nearing the completion of the book of Daniel. We have been studying the book of Daniel throughout the course of this summer and this morning and next Sunday, we are going to wrap up the book. We are going to be in chapters 10, 11, and 12, which really hold together as one unit, but there is so much packed into these three chapters that we're going to take a couple of weeks to unpack them. Uh, but we're going to keep working through it just kind of verse by verse. So go ahead, if you would, find a Bible. If you, if you don't have a Bible when you come here at Mountaintop, you can always pick one up as you come in the doors, and that's just a gift to you. Uh, but find Daniel chapter 10, and, uh, or pull it up on your iPhone or your iPad, or if you're online, just click on the little tab. But we're going to be in Daniel chapters 10 and 11 today. And uh, we're, we're reaching a point where we're getting into some pretty tough texts. We were talking about it between the services. And, uh, and I'm going to ask you right now, because I just feel called that we're going to work through this book and we're going to look at every text in it. And so we're going to do that today. But some of it is a little bit confusing and some of it is a little bit tough. And will you promise to stay with me as we do that? 
All right, most half of the room promise that's enough. And uh, so the rest of you just kind of hang, hang with us. The uh, Daniel 10 11 is a vision that Daniel is given, uh, uh, 10 11 and, and moving into 12, a vision that Daniel is given about the future and specifically about what's going to happen at the end of days. And because of that, a lot of people get very fascinated with these texts because there's something in us that wants to know what's going to happen next. And and I want to tell you right from the outset, if what you're hoping to get out of this message is how and when the world is going to end, you're going to be disappointed um, because Daniel doesn't tell us that. Remember, the book of Daniel was written to give hope and encouragement to the people of Israel when they are living in a time of exile. And these visions are doing the same thing. God wants to give this vision to Daniel to give them and to give us hope that in the end of days that God will be in control and that God will be victorious. But you can find a thousand books and a thousand websites that want to tell you how and when the world is going to end. Um, Daniel doesn't say any of that. It's interesting, when Jesus taught on the end of days, Jesus uh, referenced these chapters in Daniel as part of his teaching. And, And Jesus said this in Matthew 24, he says, the truth is, no one knows the hour or the day, not the messengers in heaven, not the son, only the father knows. And so any website or book you can find that wants to tell you the day and the hour, somehow think they're smarter than Jesus. And, uh, God bless them. That's just a good, good thing for them. Uh, they are challenging texts. And, and here's what, what I have found helpful to me whenever I am looking at a challenging passage of Scripture is to remember a very simple principle that's found in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. And it's in chapter 29, verse 29, which makes it easy to remember. And it simply says this, only the eternal knows the secret things. But we and our descendants are responsible for what has been revealed to us. There are secret things that belong only to God. And some of our questions about the end times are secret things that belong to God. But there are things revealed that belong to us. And and there is a lot that's revealed to us in Daniel 10 and 11. And so we're going to take a look this morning at what gets revealed to us. So starting in chapter 10, let me give you just a little bit of background. These events are happening somewhere around 535 BC. The Persian Empire, Cyrus is the king of Persia, the Persian Empire has taken over the Babylonians, and Israel's 70 years of captivity are coming to a close. In fact, some of the people of Israel have already started to return to Jerusalem. Daniel is probably in his late to mid 80s, and he's, he's grown too old to travel. And so Daniel is staying in Babylon. And he is uh, kind of at a place in his life where he is starting to reflect back and, and also kind of looking forward and, and wondering what God's plan is for the people of, of Israel. And, uh, and he's asking a lot of questions. And where we find him here, he's out on a prayer retreat and, uh, and maybe seeking, seeking God's vision. Uh, we've seen this th- throughout the course of the book. Daniel has risen to positions of high power and authority, and he has stood before kings. And sometimes he has stood boldly before kings and told them things that they didn't want to hear. And Daniel did it without compromising. But now in this vision that he has in Daniel 10, he's going to stand before another kind of king and it's just going to completely undo him. So uh, Daniel 10, starting down in verse five. And, and when you read this, try not to, to try to pin down details. Try just to, to picture the vision that Daniel has here. First, start verse five. He says, I lifted my eyes and I saw what seemed at first to be a man dressed in linen clothing. Around his waist was the belt made of the purest gold. His body had the appearance of yellow topaz. His face was bright like flashes of lightning. His eyes flamed like torches. His arms and legs sparkled like polished bronze. His voice sounded like thunder. And I, Daniel, alone saw this man and heard his voice. Though there were others around me who did not see this sight, they were still overcome with fear and ran to hide. But I did not. I was left all alone to witness this glorious sight. My strength soon left me. My face was drained of all its natural color. And I was confused. I had no energy at all. And then I heard his voice. 
and caught the sound of his words. And as I did, I fell into a deep sleep, my face pressed to the ground. Now, the, the text doesn't tell us specifically who this man in, dressed in linen is. A lot of scholars want to suggest that this is the pre-incarnate Christ, that this is actually Jesus that Daniel has a vision of. And there's good reason to argue that. Uh, Later in the Bible, one of Jesus' disciples, John, is going to describe Jesus very much in this same sort of imagery. And it's interesting to me that when Jesus teaches on the end times, he references these chapters in Daniel. So it's kind of a good argument that the man dressed in linen might be Jesus, but the text doesn't tell us. And so we always got to be really careful of trying to make the Bible say something that it actually doesn't really say. All we know for sure is that this is a man dressed in in linen and, um, and that Daniel is just overwhelmed when he sees who this, this man might, might be. Um, he's so overwhelmed that he, he passes out, just kind of falls to the ground and passes out. So in verse 10, another figure approaches him. We're, again, we're not told, but it's probably an angel. Um, God has countless angels, and uh, only two of God's angels get named in Scripture. Uh, Gabriel, who we've met already in the book of Daniel, and Gabriel's a messenger who is bringing a word from God or helping Daniel to understand. When you get to the New Testament, Gabriel is the one who announces the birth of John the Baptist and of Jesus to Zechariah and to Mary. And, and we've been introduced to Gabriel. The other angel that gets named is the angel Michael, and Michael's going to show up a little bit later uh, in this chapter. But... Uh, it's probably a good bet that Gabriel is the one here, the messenger that is speaking to Daniel. And uh, Daniel passes out, and you get to verse 10. It says, Just then a mighty hand touches me and lifts my trembling body onto my hands and knees. And the messenger says, Daniel, you are highly regarded by God. Wouldn't that be cool to hear? You are highly regarded by God. I have been sent to help you understand the destiny of your people. Stand up and listen carefully to what I have to tell you. And Daniel says that as the messenger spoke, he slowly rose to his feet, though he was still shaking. Of course, he's shaking. And the messenger says, Daniel, don't be afraid. From the very first day that you began to pursue understanding and humble yourself before God, your words have been heard. And I've been sent in response to what you said. I would have been here sooner... However, for the past 21 days, the spirit prince of Persia opposed me and prevented my coming to you. Then Michael, here's the mention of Michael, one of the chief princes of heaven, came to my aid because I alone was busy dealing with the kings of Persia. I've come to help you understand what will happen to your people in the last days, for this vision is about a time yet to come. Now, I just kind of want to pause here for a moment at verse 13. It says, the, the messenger, maybe Gabriel, says, I would have been here sooner. However, for the past 21 days, the spirit prince of Persia opposed me and prevented me coming to you. And, and he says it almost as if, hey, Daniel, I would have been here, but I got held up by a train. You, you understand, right? It's as if Daniel would understand this, but I read the text, and maybe you read the text, and I go, wait, well, pause here for a minute. Who's the spirit prince of Persia? I mean, who are the, I, mean, I, I don't get this. Who are these kings of Persia that, that you're, you're fighting with? And who is Michael? And, and what's the battle that, that's going on? And, and all kind of questions come up when you read a verse like that. Now, again, there are secret things that belong only to God. Here's what gets revealed to us when, when we read this. The world is more complicated than it seems. The world that we live in is more complicated than it seems. There are unseen realities. There are powers in conflict, out of sight, but very real and very present. And that conflict has an impact upon the world that we live in. The the world is more complicated than what we see with human eyes. There are things that are going on that, that that are bigger and scarier and more beautiful than we can begin to imagine. 
The, the world's more complicated than what we see with, with, with just our human eyes. When you, you get to the New Testament, Paul, and uh, we've talked about Paul a lot because he writes most of the New Testament. Paul is uh, one of the early leaders in the church, and he's writing a letter to a church that he had helped establish in the city of Ephesus. And, and this is what Paul said to the Ephesians, starting in, in, uh, in chapter 6. He said, brothers and sisters, draw your strength and might from God. Put on the full armor of God to protect yourself from the devil and his evil schemes. And then this is the important part. Paul says, we are not waging war against enemies of flesh and blood alone. No, this fight is against tyrants, against authorities, against supernatural powers and demon princes that slither in the darkness of this world and against wicked spiritual armies that lurk about in heavenly places. The world is more complicated than it seems to our human eyes. There are spiritual conflicts that are taking place all of the time and all around us, and it has an impact on the world that we live in. And so Paul says you've got to put on the armor of God, which would be a whole message series that we will do sometime. But he he says in that that the main offensive weapons that you have are the word of God and prayer. I I love in in verse 18 here, here in Ephesians 6, he says, pray always, pray in the spirit, pray about everything in every way you know how, Keep all this in mind. Pray on behalf of God's people. Keep praying feverishly and be on the lookout until evil has been stayed. So here's the lesson for us in this text. The battle is bigger than we realize and prayer is our best weapon. The battle is bigger than we realize. The struggles that are going on in this world, they're bigger than we realize and prayer is our best weapon. Now that's kind of a pause here for a moment. And um, I want to say a word about why prayer is so important to us here at Mountaintop. I I am convinced, I am absolutely convinced that our future as a church is dependent upon prayer. Not not upon the messages that I give or how good our band might be or, or what programs we offer or what cool things we do with kids and students and as we send people out, out serving. Uh, all of that is really important and we want to do all that very well, but none of that makes any difference without prayer. Prayer is the engine that will drive our church. Our future is dependent upon prayer. The most important thing that that I can do and that you can do and the leaders and our staff that all of us can do is to pray. Uh, This fall, just give you kind of a couple quick plugs. Um, And actually, in just in a couple of weeks, we're going to set aside the week of August 19th as a week of prayer. We did this back in January, and we want to do it again as we start a new school year. And for that week, starting Monday morning, we are going to gather right here in this room, and we are going to gather at 6 a.m., which I know is really, really early in the morning and requires a sacrifice on a lot of people's part. Um, But I don't think it's worth giving to God anything that doesn't cost us a little something and a little sleep's not too much to pay. And, uh, and we're going to gather here at 6 a.m. and we're going to pray for Mountaintop. And we're going to do that every morning that week. And, and I'd encourage you to put that on your calendar now. There is nothing more important we can do this year than to spend that week together in prayer. And so I'd, I'd, we'd, I'd love to see this room as full uh, at 6 a.m. on those mornings as it is uh, at 9.15 and 11.30 on a Sunday morning as, uh, as we have a chance to, uh, to pray and to pray together. Uh, secondly, uh, this fall I'm going to do a four-week message series on prayer. And I've been spending some time this summer, uh, the time that I've had away, to work on a four-week devotional guide and a study guide uh, to be used by individuals and to be used as small groups. God has just really placed it upon my heart that, that he needs his whole church to come together focused around uh, prayer and that we might learn how to pray better together and that we, we might actually then pray together as a church. I just can't say it enough. Our future is going to be dependent upon prayer. And it's, uh, so we're going to focus a lot on that as we head into the coming months. And one of the things that I've seen as we've been working through Daniel is that Daniel was, was so devoted to prayer Daniel receives this vision while he's out, again, while he's out on a prayer retreat. He's gotten out of the city. He's spending time praying and asking God, God, what's going to happen to my people? And that's when he receives this vision and God reveals it to him. Prayer was so important to Daniel. And so he gets this vision and, uh, and it just overwhelms him. 
And, and again, we saw he, he passes out and, and kind of uh, just going to summarize the, the next verses. Uh, the, the messenger reaches out to him and, and tells him to be strong. And then the man in linen comes over and reaches out to him as well. And it all strengthens Daniel. And you get kind of towards the, the end of the vision. And Daniel says, at his words, I grew even stronger. And then Daniel says, so now will you please continue, my Lord? Give me this vision. I I can stand it. I can take it now. Please continue, my Lord, for your words have given me strength. And then we get into chapter 11, which is the heart of the vision itself. And, uh, And there's some tough passages to understand in here because this was all beginning to talk about future events that are going to take place. And and most of what's described here in chapter 11 takes place 250, 300 years and beyond in the time that Daniel was living. Uh, It starts this way in verse 3. It says, um, Meanwhile in Greece, a warrior king will come to power, and with great authority he will rule his lands and do as he desires. But no sooner than he rises, his kingdom will be broken up and divided to the four winds of heaven. Um, Give you a little bit of of history. Uh, Daniel's receiving this vision at the time Cyrus is the king of Persia. And for the hundred years that follow this, four other Persian kings are going to arise and each kind of come and fall. The last of them is going to grow in power and he's going to want to take on the king of Greece who happens to be the warrior king, Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great is just going to kind of wipe this guy off the map and ends up just taking over you know, most of the known world at that time and just completely, you know, wipes out, wipes out Persia. And, um, and here's Daniel 250 years before that's happening predicting all of this with just absolute clarity. It says, again, in verse 4, his kingdom broken up, divided to the four winds of heaven. Um, Alexander the Great's kingdom is broken up and divided into four pieces. And eventually, two kind of rise, a king in the north, the Seleucid Empire, and a king in the south, the, uh, the Ptolemy Empire. And they begin to have this struggle back and forth between the two of them with Israel caught right there in the middle of it. And, and again, Daniel 11 is foretelling all of this, and, uh, and it's all going to happen way off in the future, just predicting it with absolute accuracy. A lot of chapter 11 is about a Seleucid king, Antiochus IV, and he was about as evil as evil could be. Uh, just, a, just a horrible, horrible guy. Um, he persecuted the Jews. He sacrifices a pig in the temple, which was just an abomination to the people of Israel. He claims deity for himself. He, and he, he's talked about a lot here in chapter 11, uh, predicting that, that he would come. But more importantly, he's a foreshadowing of another king of the north that is going to come. Um, verse 36, it says this, as the king of the north will come and he will do as he desires and he will elevate himself and make the audacious claim that he is greater than all of the gods. And he'll say horrendous things about the one who is truly God of gods. He'll be successful in his exploits, but not forever. For the time of wrath must be fulfilled and what is decreed must be accomplished. The New Testament describes this figure as well, uh, most prominently in 2 Thessalonians. Um, But this is the figure that sometimes we will use the term antichrist to describe. And and that's a word that only gets used once in the Bible, but it's one that we have picked up and and we often apply to this king of the north that will will show up. And Here's the deal. For as long as people have been reading these texts, they have been trying to figure out who this king of the north is and exactly when he's going to come and what he's going to do and and what it's going to look like. And over history, we have uh, predicted that a lot of people or or suggested that a lot of people are the Antichrist. And uh, I did this just kind of for fun this week. I went and I did a, I just did a Google search on who is the Antichrist. And you'd be kind of shocked by some of the answers that come up when when you do that. Uh, Every political figure you can imagine Um, A lot of religious leaders uh, get accused of being the Antichrist. A lot of popular celebrities. I don't think Oprah is the Antichrist. A lot of uh, football coaches, a lot of college football coaches show up on that list. Um, Good arguments could be made that whoever's coaching at the University of South Carolina would fall into that category. I I think a lot of what happens there is an abomination beyond desolation um, each and every Saturday. But that's just me. Um, Here's the deal. The text doesn't tell us specifically 
This is one of these secret things that belong to God, not something revealed to us. And as tempting as it is to try to read through chapters of Scripture, like chapter 11, and try to get it figured out precisely, because that's our human nature, Jesus said, nobody knows. And, and focus on what gets revealed to us. Here, here's mostly what gets revealed to us. Look at the last chapter, uh, the last verses. Um, it says that one day, uh, this, uh, down verse 45, it says, one day he will pitch his palatial royal tents, this king of the north, between the great sea and the holy mountain of beauty, Mount Zion. Then and there his end will come and no one will stand with him. This is the important part. This is what gets revealed to us. Again, his end will come. His end will come. And then you get to the first verses of uh, chapter 12. Um, and we're going to dig into chapter 12 next, next Sunday. His end will come. No one will stand with him. At that time, Michael, the great heavenly prince, the grand defender and guardian of your people will arise. Again, when Jesus was teaching on the end of days, Jesus went back to these verses in Daniel as, as, as reference to what he was talking about. And Jesus said, in effect, the same thing. He said, it's not going to last forever. That the Son of Man, he will come with glory and he will come with power and he will establish a kingdom of justice and righteousness that will stand forever. But until then, until then, things are going to be tough. In fact, Jesus said it this way. This is Matthew 24. Jesus says that, that in the last days that they will hand you over to your enemies and they will torture you and they will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of me. And many who have followed me and claimed to love me and sought God's kingdom will turn away and they'll abandon the faith and they will betray and hate one another. And the love they had for one another will grow cold. I don't know why, but for some reason that last line just always kind of gets me. The love that they had for one another will grow cold. Here, this is the challenge for you and me. Here's what gets revealed to us from, uh, from these two chapters. The battle that rages around us is bigger than we realize. Prayer is our best weapon, so don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. That's why we're going to focus so much as a church as fall on, on prayer. And when the world is spinning out of control, and when it feels like evil has the last word, and, and the king of the north is, is just, just taking over, to, uh, here's the challenge to remember that his days are numbered. It's all going to come to an end. And that God will be victorious, and, and he will establish his kingdom of righteousness and justice that will, will last forever. And so when the world is, is just unraveling around us, don't give up, don't give in, don't turn away, and please don't let your love grow cold for one another or for a world that so desperately needs to be loved. When, when we're facing a, a, a world that, that doesn't make sense and a world that's falling apart, we just can't let our love grow cold. We've got to keep getting off the mountain. We've got to keep serving. We've got to keep loving. We've got to keep learning and then sharing this better way of life that we have found in Jesus Christ, a way that offers us life that is truly life today and a way to live forever beyond the end of days. This is what Daniel's trying to tell us throughout this book. That when things seem hopeless, we still have hope because God is in control in spite of our present circumstances. That our God sees in the dark and light spills out of him. That he will meet us in the fire and he will rescue us from the lions. Kings and kingdoms, they may rise and fall, but at the end of days, God's kingdom will remain. That's the hope we cling to. It's a promise that is fulfilled through Jesus Christ who came and lived for us and who died for us and who rose again to make that life possible. So would you pray with me? Lord, it's, uh, it's hard sometimes to stand firm when the world's just swirling around us. And it's hard sometimes when, when things seem confusing in this world. But Lord, what you have revealed to us is that at the end of days, that you will be victorious. 
that at the end of days all evil will be defeated and even death will be, will be defeated and that we can hold on to that promise and that we can build our lives upon it and that nothing in the world can shake us if, if we will just hold and cling to you. Help us to do that as we, we head out into this week, as we face confusing situations in our lives, as we face situations that may seem hopeless in our lives. Help us to remember that in you we have victory and that in you we can stand firm. We pray all that and we do it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and we're going to sing together this hope that we profess. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the Okay, next Sunday, we are going to wrap up the Daniel series with chapter 12, and it's really the continuation of what we started to talk about today. So you really want to be here as we wrap up the series. I'd encourage you to bring a friend. Uh, next week, we get to live into the promise of the everlasting life that has been, uh, that's been assured for us through Jesus Christ. And so come and to be a part of that. Uh, two quick invitations as you're leaving this morning. If you came here and you're, you're carrying a burden around and, and it's something that, that you've just been tired of carrying all by yourself and you'd like for someone to pray with you, we've got a team that meets right over here in, in our prayer corner and right after the service is over, they will be there and they would love to pray with you this morning. So please don't leave here. Uh, if you have something you'd like to lift up in prayer, uh, go join them there. And again, if you're uh, a guest with us today, we are so glad that you were here at Mountaintop this morning. We'd love to tell you a little bit more about us and you can have that happen out here in Starting Point and there'll be people there who can share with you a lot that's going on around here. Uh, Remember that as we go forth from here, we never leave here alone, but our living Lord Jesus Christ, he goes with us. May he go above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you peace, and before you to show you his way now and forevermore. Amen. Hey, we have had an awesome time worshiping this morning, and we hope that you had fun worshiping with us online. Did you have fun worshiping this morning? You sing really well. You know, they can hear you sing. They can't hear me sing. Hey, uh, we hope you have a great week. And then next week, either here on campus or online, that you'll join us again as we wrap up Daniel 12. But until then, may God bless you this week, and we'll see you soon. Take care. All right, you go sing. Does everything change when I met you? So I'm laying on my tomorrow in your hands. Sitting on every word you say, holding on to your promises. And I know my hope and my future found in you. With everything that you start. Best of my life, best days of my life. We can find your mercies new, walking upon your grace and truth, and I know the Spirit will lead me on my way. Home. With everything that you 